Welcome to the Unstoppable Profit Podcast. Wherever you are today, if you're starting with nothing or are well on your way to the success you desire with the right people, processes, and promotions in place, you will be unstoppable. And now, I'd like to introduce your host, Mike Stromso. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the Unstoppable Profit Podcast. And this one is going to be extra profitable because uh, the guys that I got on the podcast this morning, uh, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of who they are, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper. And you know, as we're getting started this morning, uh, we were just talking about uh, the bull behind uh, Bradley, uh, the unstoppable Bradley Flowers and the double unstoppable Scott Howell, not to put one of you above the other. Welcome, gents. What's up? Hey, thank, you for, thank you for having us, Mike. We uh, appreciate you having us on the show today. It means a lot. Well. Wow. I appreciate you guys and all you do for the industry. And this is long overdue, uh, this episode, uh, because uh, you, you guys have done so much and, and we've worked together and you've host, you had me on your podcast and I want to reciprocate and then some. But let me get to this before I squirrel away from it. And SOS is sitting right over here. It's shiny object syndrome. And in the words of one of our unstoppable members uh, who – uh, renamed it BSOS, Bright Shiny Object Syndrome, because she's got that deadly disease. Uh, Bradley, what's up? I asked you if you're a Buffalo Bills fan, and uh, I'm definitely not. What's going uh, on with the bull? So, so the Buffalo behind me, uh, the reason for the Buffalo, and when, and when Mike asked about it, I said, oh, you're going to love this. And he said, well, let me start recording. Um, so I heard this on another podcast. I don't know the name of the podcast. Um, there's a company. It was actually an EOS podcast, and there's about – you know, there's 15 or so little fringe EOS podcasts. And I was just getting into EOS. So I was listening to it. And there was this business that um, their entire culture was sent around buffaloes down to uh, they send a bottle of Buffalo Trace to their new clients, Buffalo Trace bourbon. Um, obviously, they're in some kind of heavy B2B with higher revenue than insurance. Uh, so we sent, you know, Buffalo Trace to every one of our new clients. We would go out of business very fast. Uh, and the reason why <laughs> I'm glad you added the bourbon on. Yeah. The reason why <laughs> is, uh, when a storm rolls into the plains, instead of running away from the storm, Buffalo run into the storm because they know that that gets them through the storm the fastest. So not only does that speak to, you know, dealing with problems head on, because I mean, I think you would agree. I mean, there's no motivational speaker that's ever existed or business consultant that's ever existed. That's going to tell you to not deal with your hardest, you know, worst problems head on at the beginning of the day. Um, but in insurance, we literally deal with storms. So as soon as I heard that, I said, by God, I have to get a Buffalo painting in my office. So that's, that's the reason for the Buffalo. You're the second person that's asked for asked about it. So that that's a great story. And, and that's, you know, I'm going to ask you another question uh, out of left field here in a second, because uh, speaking of storms, yeah, the storms happen all the time, but you know, it's what we do with them that makes mm -hmm. all the difference. Right. Yep. Cause a lot of people aren't buffaloes or they're not lions, if you will, you know, lions, not sheep. Uh, because the ones who don't, you know, make, make forward progress in this world, run away from it. So yep. let's be lions, not sheep. There we go. Look at Scott. He's got it done underneath. I was wearing mine this morning, but, you know, I switched to my UPP lights this morning. I love that, man. So, you know, be a buffalo right into the storm, right, Bradley? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, and, it, and it's definitely something that um, I've been guilty of. I think a lot of us have of not dealing with our hardest problems first and, and fast. And, you know, time, time makes every problem worse. And I definitely have been guilty of putting stuff that I should handle on the back burner. So that's why it's in my office. And we talk about it in our team meetings, but that's why it's in my office is to remind me right. to handle my problems head on. I think that's, uh, I'm not, I tell people all the time, I'm horrible at 98% of things. <laughs> and this is Scott right now. Uh, yeah, I know hey, what he's Scott. about to say. And I agree with what he's about to say. That is, that is one of my superpowers. Scott's um, going to deal with it. He's going to jump in there. We're going to get it out in the air right now. Yeah, we're, we're going to jump on it as fast as I can jump on it. So yep. one of the things I tell people all the time, Mike, is do not give problems oxygen. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's like a, I was I was burning brush fires this weekend at my property because we've cleared like 30, like uh, probably 15 acres of land. So I've got these huge brush piles. And one of the ways to get a brush pile going that most people don't understand is you can put a, a backpack blower on your back, light the brush fire, and then give that that fire oxygen with that backpack blower just like you were blowing leaves in your front yard and when you have clients that are upset about a claim or employees that are upset about something the faster you can get to that and not give it oxygen the better off you are and 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 unfortunately in the industry a lot of times people kind of take the exact opposite approach you know they 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 i'm going to wait a couple days to call them back or i'm going to We'll talk about this problem later. And all that happens is you're giving that problem oxygen. So that brush fire is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, I just feel like the best thing to do, and no matter who you are listening to this podcast right now, you know as well as I do that when you finally do get up the courage, and a lot of times that's what it is, courage, to sit down and talk about a problem, whether it's with a, with a client, whether it's with an employee, whether it's with your spouse, most of the time, 95% of the time, after you have that discussion, you feel better about it. You feel like this relief, this, uh, mm -hmm. this thing that that's now off your shoulders. And the other part of that is when you have big problems that you need to go head first, like a, what, like a Buffalo towards, once you get that thing going or it's off your plate, now you have more mental energy because yeah. in the back of your mind, you're not thinking about it all the time. So you, you, you're taking up mental space that maybe you don't even realize thinking about that problem where if you'd have just talked about it, hey, now it's off the table. Now I can use that mental space to think about something else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens too? is when you have a problem, let's say you get an email and there's an issue, there's some bad news that you have to deliver to a client, right? There, for me, there's about a 120 second window where my mind doesn't, I don't allow my mind to go to all the bad things that can happen. Oh, they're going to be mad and they're going to yell and they're going to cancel their business with me. I, I've learned myself when I have bad news to deliver to someone, I have about 120 seconds to get to it before my mind starts wondering and the anxiety sets in and the, and then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well, I'll wait till tomorrow. So what I tell my team is if you have bad news to deliver to a client, do it in the first 120 seconds, get it out of the way. And you're good after that. Yeah, you can Because move on. we've all had these problems where it just weighs on you and weighs on you and weighs on you. And then all of a sudden it, it becomes bigger than it is. And then you end up handling it. And the person's like, oh, okay, whatever, that's fine. I was expecting that. Right. 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 That's Sorry. awesome. Sorry, that Mark. is great information because our mindsets are skill set. And right. whatever we allow into our mind after the 120 seconds is going to start to yeah. change it. Yeah. Well, and, it's opportunity and not the, not cost the, too. Yeah. And lots yeah. of focus. That's why, I, that's why I don't trade crypto. Like I, 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 I buy crypto, but I have friends that they sit there and they look at the crypto screen all day long or whatever it is. It could be the stock market. And I'm like, I, pr I appreciate the validity of that, but I'm losing brain space. I'm losing opportunity cost of brain space by sitting here worrying about what the market's doing all day. I'll log in at the end of the day and look and see what my account did. I'm not going to sit here and watch it all day long. Right. Bradley, Bradley said it best just a second ago. The other thing that human beings do is if you don't run into that problem, your mind will start playing tricks on you. And you start building up all this stuff in your mind. They're going to say this. They're going to do that. They're going to say if you would have just called them within 100, what, 120 seconds, 130 seconds, uh, you won't have to sit there and think about what they're going to say because now you know what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, it's like personal and professional relationships, right? right? I mean, what do you do personally? If something yep. blows up personally, you go to the people closest to you right away and you deal with it. Right. That's exactly okay? right. And, and it's the same transition because, you know, people do business with people and so in celebration of today that they know love and trust correct mm -hmm. right and money follows trust so you know yep. to what bradley said uh you know if you give them that decency and, and reach out to them right away let them know what's going on mm -hmm. uh, let them know that hey we are here for you we're going to work through this with you right by your side I, I don't have a solution right now but i wanted to be up front with you and let you know what's going on 
and we've got a plan and we're going to work right by your side with you because, I mean, I'm sure you guys hear this in everybody that you talk to, high achieving, high performing agencies out there. Uh, how often do we find out? And I found it, you know, over my 36 years that we we'll talk to people and say, hey, I've reached out to my agent. I reached out to my agent. And I never hear back from them. It's like yep. crickets. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, how do people do business like that? So, well, and I think it's important to, from an insurance sales standpoint, you know, I would, I would dare to say that 90% of the problems that we deal with that make a client upset are things that are out of our control. Mm. Probably either carrier related or something that a client did that was stupid that, that we couldn't help. Right. And I think it's important when you deliver bad news, a portal, portal has a pretty good retention rate. And right. one of the things that I attribute to that is when we have to deliver bad news to a client, we always reiterate that, hey, you would have had this problem regardless of the carrier that you're with. One of the big problems we have right now is all of our carriers, because we're coastal, are pretty strict on post-bind inspections or, or midterm inspections, and they're being super picky about things. And we reiterate like, hey, no matter the carrier we had you with, no matter the agency you were with, you were going to run into this problem. So it sort of subconsciously, subliminally tells that client like, hey, I'm not the person to blame here. Don't get me. This isn't because you chose to do business with Portal, right? It's, it's, it's this, this would have happened regardless. And I think that's super important to note when you're delivering bad news to a client. Reiterate that, reiterate that it's not your, it's your problem, but you were, you're not the cause of that problem. Absolutely. Hey, Scott, by the way, uh, next time you come out to the house, you can't do brush fires out of my house. <laughs> no, hey, he, he, he almost burned all the woods down. You want to tell yeah, that? I had a uh, Saturday night at dark. I had the volunteer fire department down the street. Uh, they, they were Mike cool. would have started a brush fire this weekend in San Diego. He'd be in jail right now. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, I wouldn't be here hosting this. Correct. <laughs> well, I had the, I had the entire volunteer fire department from Brindley Mountain, Alabama, in my on my property at 6 30 saturday night in full firefighter outfit because somebody across the mountain or as we say here in alabama across the holler <laughs> had, had had seen what was an optical illusion that looked like i was burning the woods down 300 acres of woods which i was not but they had to come out to check that out anyway i didn't don't, hate to get off on a tangent there but you, you want me to tell you, can I tell everybody my max, my father's maxim about volunteer firefighters, please. So there's one distinct difference between a volunteer firefighter. And this, I don't mean any offense to anybody's listening to this. If you're a volunteer firefighter and a person that does it for a living person that does it for a living is getting a paycheck. People are volunteer firefighters predominantly because it's their hobby. And in 2001-ish, my parents' house was struck. Well, I still live there. I was a kid. My parents' house struck, got struck by lightning. Mm-hmm. It did not catch on fire, but the fire alarm went off. And it was literally saying, fire, 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 get out. So we got out of the house. And I recall my mom talking to my dad on speakerphone. And he said, whatever you do, do not let the volunteer firemen into our house. Meanwhile, they're all standing around us. And my dad was a member of that volunteer fire department. He, he, they are going to te- te- go into detail what they will do. You, you gave a nice little uh, yeah, bit on well, it this weekend, what, Scott. What happens, you know, people, people don't understand this, but when you let any fire department really, uh, let's say you just have a kitchen fire, but it's, you know, it's a pretty, pretty good little fire. Well, once you let the volunteer fire department knock out all the windows in your house and pour about <laughs> 875,000 gallons of water into your house. The least of your problems is a fire. The, the bigger right. issue now is, and, and we, you know, same with, 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 you know, paid firemen as well, because people don't realize when they get there and they hook up to that fire hydrant with those, those big 12 gauge or whatever those hoses uh-huh. are, and they start pumping that water into your house, it, you got big problems. But you get a level of you get a level of gung ho, yes, with volunteer fire. And in oh, fact, they're, they're, they are the, praying for a house fire. That same volunteer fire department, the chief got in trouble because they had an exorbitant amount of calls one year, and turns out he was the one setting the stuff on fire just so they could have, <laughs> just so they could go in and and put it out. You know. Yeah. He's in jail for arson right now. <laughs> I think he did get put in jail, but it, he's definitely not still in jail. I don't think. But anyway. Yeah. 
Sorry, Mike. We're getting off on tangent. No, no. Hey, my, my question is, think about it. How many did you have at the house, Scott? In my house? No, no. How many fi- volunteer firefighters were there Saturday night? Uh, at least six, probably seven. Okay, so is that a new marketing plan? Did you get all the prospect information? There you go. There you go. <laughs> no, I did not. It was pitch black outside, and I was worried they were about to call the police department on me for – you know, something that I didn't even know I wasn't supposed to be doing. So well, I, I, was, I don't, I don't know if they talk about this stuff across the holler. I, I picked that up. Yeah. There's a thing called flashlight. So, you know, yep. always have a flashlight in hand so you can get their prospect information just quickly. Yep. Because all you want to do is help them. Right. Right. You want to teach I, them about, you want to educate them about insurance so they can be better volunteer firefighters. I, I will say, Mike, you bring up a great point as we're walking away from my brush fire back up to their trucks, which by the way, they parked in my mother-in-law and father-in-law's <laughs> driveway, which caused another issue. Uh, I look over to my left. My electrician was one of the volunteer fire dep- firemen that were there. And I looked at him and I go, you're my electrician. And he was like, yep, that's exactly who I am. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it was, it was a uh, comical to say the least. Well, congratulations. I'm glad nothing else burned and uh, you got accomplished what you set out to accomplish as it should be. And yep. you fought through the storm. There you go. So, you know, uh, speaking of head walking into the storm and, and taking on things head on and keeping our mindset in the right place. What are you guys studying right now? Just to do oh, a quick add on. Um, that's a great question. So for me right now, I just started uh, Saturday during my brush fire incident. Uh, because when I'm working outside, that's what I love to do. My, if you want to call it a hobby, some people play golf. I work in the on my property uh, doing different, you know, things. But I've started a book, and you may have been the one that gave me this. I'm not sure, but I went to Audible University, as we like to call it. Mm-hmm. And I downloaded the book, The Road Less Stupid. And I don't know if you've read that or not. Somebody – in the insurance industry. And I can't remember who it was. Might've been Chris Paradiso might've been, I don't remember who gave it to me, but somebody sent me a message to read this book, but it is a fantastic read. And I started that Saturday in some books, Mike, cause you're a, uh, you go to audible university as well. You know how some books you start and you're like, Oh, this is going to be good. Uh Like really good. Uh This is one of those books. This is one of those books where, He's just spitting fire. Like every fourth paragraph, I'm like, man, I should be writing that down right now. Exactly. One one thing he said, it talks about um, basically that everyone in the world has decisions to make. You can control those decisions. Your success and your failure are going to be based on the good or bad decisions you make throughout your life. But the one thing you cannot control are the consequences of those decisions. Those are out of your purview of control. But he says, and I'm only on like chapter three right now. He said, it is fantastic to ask or or to, 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 to find out great answers or to have an answer that's fantastic for a different, whatever problem you're having. What's genius though, is asking the right questions. Amen. And and that goes back to a book by the, the great John Maxwell, good leaders ask great questions. And I've taken that another step. Good leaders ask great pointed questions and they shut up. Right. And it's six to one nowadays. I don't know if you guys heard that recently. It's six to one. This pie hole is the one, two ears, two eyes, that's four, one mind, that's five. And the sixth is added on by Sailor Hirsch. You guys know Sailor Hirsch, by the way? Do not. Oh, my gosh. I need to introduce you to her. She was on the podcast a few episodes ago. Dynamic, dynamic out of Oklahoma. She's a branding person. She says she was on the podcast. She goes, Mike, what about the sixth one? I said, what are you talking about, Sailor? She goes, the heart. There you go. So heart, mind, two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. We need to use it in that proportion. I that is great that. stuff. I have not heard about that book, and I'm going to drop uh, the one that's severely impacted me in a positive way uh, in a second. Bradley, what are you doing to keep your mindset in the right place, brother? There's a couple things. Um, I am uh, preparing to start the journey of my CIC designation. 
Um, Congratulations. I am doing that. Uh, and this is a little bit of an inside joke, but I'm doing that to uh, better help my clients and better help my team help my clients, not to add letters after my name on LinkedIn. Um, and so I'm getting ready to embark on that journey while at the same time having a uh, brand new baby. So I'm also studying the back of my eyelids at any moment that I can. And, and then lastly, from a marketing social media standpoint, I am obsessively studying Instagram reels. There's a, there's a play there right now for people putting out educational Instagram reels. And uh, so that, I would say those three things. And along with studying my agency, man, like we, we just recently hired a, a fractional CFO um, to help us kind of get our crap in order from a back-end accounting financial standpoint, not that it was out of order, but I, I would dare to say that compared to a lot of independent agencies, we're doing okay. But, um, you know, when I, when I first started in this industry, I was young. I was hired at Alpha Insurance. I was the youngest agent in the company. And uh, the way that I overcompensated for my age was being uh, the most prepared person you would ever meet. So, so I learned everything about every prospect, everything about every policy I could sell them. They never met with someone that was not more prepared to sell them that product or talk to them about that product. And I, I wore a suit and tie to overcompensate for my age, even though I don't do it anymore. <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing now. So like, he changed I the think, suit for a beard. I think there's going to be a play here in the next few years uh, for agencies to acquire especially for someone like myself, who's ready to grow. I think that we live in a digital zoom world and it's a lot easier to run an agency remotely than it used to be. And I think that, uh, uh, there's going to be a play here. So what we have to do is we have to just like young Bradley flowers, young portal, we have to get our financial house in order in order to be able to get ready to do that. So I've hired a, a, a CFO who's not only helping me with like book stuff, but more like best practices on how to do things and accounting and all that, all that kind of stuff. So that's really the big one, honestly. So just getting that together that way we're, we're the most prepared when that opportunity pre presents itself. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the latest uh, props, if you will, uh, you guys keep dropping these. This is a gold nugget. <laughs> For those of you who are on the visual of the podcast, those were some gold nuggets from both these gentlemen that just, they keep dropping them and dropping them. Uh, that's part of the reason that we just had Aaron Stocks on the podcast last episode because of the fact that, yes, in, in working with agencies all over America, I mean, some very high achieving agencies don't completely have their financial house in order. And if you are going to scale and you are going to grow, numbers don't lie, my friends. Anybody yes. listening to this or watching this, uh, these two gentlemen know that, but numbers don't lie. Yeah. And we've got to have it in order. In addition to that, you never know when that opportunity is going to surface. Mm -hmm. It could happen in the next 33 minutes. Yeah. Right. And if it surfaces and you're not ready, you know, remember our buddy, our buddy Ben Franklin, right? If you're failing to prepare, you're preparing yeah. to fail. You got to be prepared all the flipping time. Well, and some people, you know, it's funny, like, like some people, if, if they knew, if they looked at what I was doing on the back end, they would think, oh, he's getting ready to sell his agency because I'm doing things that you have to do before you sell your agency. I couldn't be further from that. Like in order to get to where I need to get, I have to, I have to make sure my stuff is in order before we, we start expanding in that capacity. Um, but it's interesting, man. There's all kind of like I've learned stuff that I guarantee you 99% of agents that both you and I know aren't doing. You know, it's like everybody gets in this business. It's why people sign agreements with cluster groups that, put them in a hard spot that are crap is because you get in and everybody's like, sell business, sell business, sell business, sell business. I don't care what it looks like. Sell business, sell business. Meanwhile, you're taking a huge commission cut and all, you know, all this kind of stuff. You're not, you don't think about the back end when really what we should do is we should say, Hey, what decisions can I make today that 30 years from now, I will thank myself when I go to sell my business. Let's, right. let's start there. I'm not a huge Dave Ramsey fan, but one thing I like about Dave Ramsey is when people call and ask for advice, he says, what advice are you going to wish you, what strategy are you going to wish you did five years from now, 10 years from now? Let's ask her. Let's ask, you know, 20 year olds, 20 year from now, Sally, rather than Sally right now, you know? So that, it's that, starting at the end and going backwards. Start but, with that, the end in mind. Go ahead, yeah. Scott. 
that, that goes back to what I said earlier. You know, you're making decisions today. You know, you may not know what the consequences are going to be five or 10 years down the road, and you may not be able to control those, but we've, your level of success will, will be deeply um, dictated by the level of decisions that you're making today. And successful people typically make great decisions. Those people that you see that maybe aren't quite as successful, maybe somewhere in the past they made some decisions that here we are 10 years later, if we had it to do over again, maybe we would have done something different. So uh, you have to be very thoughtful before you make, make, especially make big decisions like, you know, I'm starting an independent agency and the different, you know, you know, Mike, the different, avenues that you can go down and I think that's one area in your coaching that you really when you get some of these younger agents that maybe are just now getting started in the business mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of them can really lean on you to help them make great decisions year one year two year three that will benefit them 10 years down the road well, absolutely just, just to know where you stand so like one example I give is uh, I hired the CFO in December and it was Carrie Wallace, by the way. Um, she, she's my fractional CFO. Uh, and I was very, um, disappointed in what our percentage profit was that we brought home compared to the gross revenue. I thought it was low and I get on a call with her and I mentioned, you know, what our margin was. And she said, Bradley, you're a three-year agency. That's phenomenal. She's like, I've got an agency right now that is doing 99% of things very well. They're five years in, they're not even profitable yet. She's like a good agency's at X percentage. I think we were 4% lower than that, you know? So, um, so it, it, it just, just having that person to lean on makes all the difference in the world of like, Oh, okay, I'm good. Cause it took it completely flipped my attitude. Right. That's, that is great information. Thank you for sharing that as an encouragement for everybody. I mean, Gold nugget after gold nugget after gold nugget they're dropping. But to, to piggyback on something that Bradley said, I'm going to drop two things and I'm going to let you go, Scott, because I know you're itching here. But absolutely, there are contracts out there, cluster agreements. I mean, I, we've got a, a coaching member that I got to, you know, help with one. And it was like, they'll never get out from the under, they'll never get out from under it. So ultimately, what I want to encourage people to do is make sure that you reach out to somebody who might be closer to the end and get that advice before you sign on the dotted line. If you're listening or watching this, please, please, please. The other experience that I've been privileged to have in my journey so far is having uh, studied under a couple of real billionaires and, and grown up with one of their businesses. Uh, what I learned is the CFO and we, as entrepreneurial people out there in the world, we should only be doing the things that only we can do and then surround ourselves with other people like Brad, Brad, Bradley's alluding to the fractional CFO and let them run with the things that only they can do their expertise. And, and that's the essence of a team. But I, what I remember from the CFO that I was dealing with in this now $1.3 billion company that was a client as well, I, I identified in their financial statement. I said, Hey, who are these people, these people, these people, I haven't seen them before. They said, Oh, my credit facilities. I just churned about $150 million all of the time to grow the business. And I thought, aha, that's what I learned from the first billionaire that I studied under live back 15, 18 years ago. He said the same thing. OPM, OPM, OPM. But if you don't get your financial house in order, those OPM people are saying, hey, take a walk down the road, Scott House property, and you can watch the, the brush fires burning. Come back when you get your financial house in order. Yep. Scott, you're with you're something, brother. You down with OPM, Scott? I'm down with OPM. Yeah. Well, I was just going to add that for 2022, my goal is to uh, get a lot better at what we call in this industry best practices. I think that's an area where a lot of insurance agents fall, fall short, and I'm one of them. And that includes things like, you know, cost per employee, cost per policy, you know, making sure we know day to day what our retention ratio is per producer for the agency, 
life hack for you guys. Take what your W-2 said this year. If you're S corporation, you may have distributions as well. Add all that together. Whatever Agreed. your whatever your income is, divide that by 2,080. So let's say uh, what you'll get from that number, whatever whatever you made last year, personally, not your agency, but personally, divide that by the number 2,080. Just and for those who don't know, Scott, what is that? That's the you know, forty-hour work week. Right. You know, take that out over a year. That's two thousand and eighty. Mm-hmm. That's going to give you guys the number, your hourly cost. So for me, that's about a hundred and twenty dollars an hour. What does that do for you guys? It lets you know the next time you're working on something that isn't equal to hundred and twenty dollars an hour for Scott that you probably don't need to be working on that. That needs to be delegated because my, my cost per hour is about $120 an hour. Now, each one of you, very simple calculation can figure out what that number is. Let's mine's, say, let's say, let's say you made six. Huh? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> so if you make $50,000, if your W-2 or what you're reporting to the internal revenue service is $50,000 this year, for 2021 divided by 2080 then you're at about $24 an hour so anything less than that you probably don't you need to be delegating and, that and so, and that's what he, that's what Scott's trying to say because if you can then take let's say there's a task and you can then take that task if you make $24 an hour you can take that task and delegate it for 12 yep it makes sense to do that you know the biggest scam that it was ever taught to people in this world, whether it be from school or from the status quo or the way we've always done things is identify your weaknesses and try to improve them. Yep. That is incorrect. What you should try to do is you should identify your weaknesses, recognize them, be self-aware enough to know what you are weak at and then hire outsource or delegate around those weaknesses. Then you identify your strengths and figure out what can I do to double down on these strengths. Now, where you get into tricky water is when there's something that you like to do, but you're actually not strong enough to, or uh, you're strong enough at that task to do it. Recognizing that to me, that's when you go from, from just a real boss to a leader and a company, a company owner to a CEO where you can say, Hey, I like doing this task, but I'm not really good at it. So I'm going to outsource it. Yeah. Yeah. And you and, and I will say, as far as weaknesses go, you'll you'll hear people like Gary Vaynerchuk talk about this. Like, you need to know enough about it to be dangerous. Yeah. You know, just be just because Bradley outsourced his you know fractional CFO, he still needs to know enough about. It. You don't need to be like, well, I don't understand a PL. Right, but guys. There's five thousand books, YouTube videos. Th- there's not a whole lot of excuse making you can have anymore. No, nope. you know, we got what fifteen or twenty like remarkable podcasts like this UPP podcast where people can listen. The, that's one of the things that pisses me off the most about insurance agents is when they stick their fingers in their ears, kind of what Bradley says, stick their fingers in their ears and they go, I don't know. God, there's just too much information out there for you not to know. Go figure it out. Don't just sit there with your – sit on your hands and be like, I don't know how to do that. Well, hell, there's probably 25 podcasts out there right now you can go <laughs> listen to. And I mean, Carrie Wallace comes on our podcast about a month ago and she just shucks the corn down on, on agency, <laughs> agency valuations. And but then you go talk to an A, I don't understand agency valuations. Well, hell, go listen to the podcast, take notes. Yeah, know. I've got a little button below my desk, but it's not working right now. I need to get a new one. It's it's called a BS button. That's we we have all these visuals. You've seen two fingers come up and all this kind of stuff. That's hitting the BS button. Correct. Hundred percent. There's, there's too much information out there, Mike. Oh yeah. I mean, and the other thing is, just from from a business standpoint, period, whether it be the insurance agency business or otherwise, today's modern consumer, they are smarter than they've ever been. Absolutely. And they're going to call BS on you if you don't have your act together, or the OPM people or, or, or on how you scale your business. You know, who, you know who it hit the first, the first time it hit really hit before it got to us was car dealerships where mm-hmm. people were getting on the internet and they were spending 
five, 10 hours researching what they ought to be paying for this car. Where true car. Used to, huh? True, true car, car, right? That's one of them. And then they would go to the dealership and these dealerships kept acting like they were going to play the shell game. And people were like, uh-uh, I know what I ought to be paying for this car. I'll pay 41,000 for it or I'm leaving. Yep. And now, and now it's kind of come into the insurance world as well, where people are more educated. They have more places to go to research and who's the best carrier and customer Especially in harder markets. In a market yes. like I'm in, I would put me against anybody else in the country as far as our, because like the insurance is so difficult to get here. People learn and know way more about it than I think they do in other areas I would agree. that aren't as hard of a market to, to, to buy and sell insurance in. And just just be clear, because of, you know, I'm older than you guys and maybe a little bit more experienced in some areas at the ultimately there is more money out there in the United States of America than there's ever been in the history of the world. And a lot of the people that have a lot of this money, they understand the value of an agent. Yes. A consultant to stand by their side through the thick and thin in Bradley's market in the, the, you know, fire laden Western United States, they know the value and they're going to pay extra money to have that person know, love and trust to stand by their side through this. They understand that, but ultimately you got to put it on the table and help them understand it. Bigger than that, you got to prove to them that you are of value. As, as we begin to move to uh, wrap on this, guys, I mean, this is great stuff. I want to add two things. And then uh, I want to hear you guys for just a couple of minutes, talk about the future of the Insurance Guys podcast. Uh, and again, just a couple of minutes, I'll give you a couple minutes each, what your vision is for the future. Make sure that you drop the information so people can find you. And don't be one of the people with the fingers in the ears, like Bradley says, make sure you get out there and study uh, the clues that have been left. Success leaves clues. Correct. And my great encouragement for you guys, the book that I'm digesting right now, I cannot put this thing down. It's Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Mm. Talk, talk about lessons. Talk about fighting through stuff. I, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, I'm almost to the end of it. I'm like, I'm, I'm ready. So he just got done knocking down the, the federal government uh, yeah. in that battle. So I mean, great, great study. That will encourage anybody. So, yeah. you know, because of my audio uh, learning love uh, and I've, I've shifted my life, so I'm getting a good 45 minutes a day into my head to make sure that I'm properly positioned to be able to better help people. You know, so th- this may or may not be uh, attractive to pe- some people out there, but Sam Walton, I'm going to go start studying that one. I mean, Sam, Wal- Sam Walton showed up in Hamilton, Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. Listen so to, listen to this story, Mike. <clears throat> when I was about eight, nine, 10 years old, I guess I was about 10 or 11. I lived in a town called Hamilton, Alabama, the mobile home capital of the world. We have more mobile homes manufactured in Marion County, Alabama, Hamilton, Alabama. Well, it got announced that we were getting a Walmart and they build the Walmart. You know, back then, that was a big deal to get a Walmart in your little small town in Alabama. And so they have the grand opening that day, and there's thousands of people there, and everybody's at the grand opening. This guy pulls up to the grand opening of Walmart in Hamilton, Alabama, in about a 1976 Chevrolet truck, and he gets out, and it's this old man, and he's walking around, and he's looking at everything. And somebody comes up to him and says, uh, you know, can we, can we help you, sir? Just thought he was some farmer from around Hamilton. Get, guess, guess who it was? Sam Walton. Sam Walton. Wow. Yep. So did you That's actually meet him? I, I don't remember if I did or not. I, okay, I remember it was, big, it was big doings in Hamilton, Alabama <laughs> to get a Walmart. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and building any company, whether it be, you know, a smaller business and your goal is not to become – you know, prolific right. and, and huge like that. I mean, what I learned from Phil Knight of Nike through my study is he didn't necessarily intentionally think it was going to become as big as it did almost as quickly as it did, but it did. And it's going to happen. So we've got to position ourselves for that. And I want to make sure I drop some information for everybody out there. There's a, a site, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, Reagan Consulting. So just go Google Reagan Consulting Best Practices Study. It's online for you. It's, you know, 
the the they do an annual study of the best agencies out there in America. There's normally about 200 of them. And uh, we're privileged that we've had a couple of them in our platinum coaching circles. And you can self-evaluate to an extent. You can identify the, the numbers and the characteristics of your agency business that you need to have in place so that you can be the best of the best, which is always our goal, right, guys? Speaking of the best of the best, I'm going to jump to the question that I had for you as we begin to wrap today. A couple of minutes, each of you, uh, and I'll, I'll go to Bradley first, the bull. And what, what's your future vision for the Insurance Guys podcast? How can people find you guys? And what is the greatest lesson you've learned so far uh, in putting out this amazing podcast? I'm going to need a couple hours to think of that. Uh, <laughs> so as far as future, like Scott and I, like we don't have this like big grandiose business plan of we're going to create this podcast and then it's going to become a funnel for whatever. And then we're going to sell for 32 times EBITDA. Like that's never been kind of like, and, and he and I may give different answers on this. My thing with the podcast is like, we're just going to keep out putting out quality content. If the listenership went to zero tomorrow, we would still do it because what it does is it allows Scott and I to be connected to individuals like yourself. And that's how we started is we would pick guests that we wanted to get connected with. Right. So Scott and I getting on a call with Chris Paradiso and saying, Hey, we want to pick your brain. Like you and all three of us know Chris is going to say yes to that. But most of the Chris Paradiso's of the world, be like, who are these two numb nuts from Hamilton, Alabama and Sarah land? I'm not going to talk to them, but Hey, we have a podcast. It's a little bit of a different conversation. So, so I say that to say, we're just going to keep putting out content. We're going to try to help agents. People have no idea how much thought we put into the guests to make sure they are. And that's what uh, the article in Rough Notes today talks about is, you know, we put a lot of thought into our guests is, are they right for the audience and making sure there's no BS delivered. Um, but, you know, back in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, people would write books to open doors. A lot of authors will tell you, and you've written a book, very good book, by the way. I recommend it to a lot of people. A lot of people tell you books aren't profitable, but what books do is they open doors. This podcast is the book for us. It's the door opener. So, so I'm an insurance agent first. Scott's an insurance agent first. We use the podcast to help our insurance agencies. So that's kind of, that's kind of that. Um, as far as what I've learned, um, I think it's that everybody is an expert in some arena and you just have to figure out what that is. You know, initially when we started agents would reach out to me and they would ask me a question to help them with something. And it gave me a lot of anxiety in the beginning. Cause I'm like, I have a really small agency. I don't deserve. And so then what I figured out through trial and error is if I only talk about things that I know I'm the expert in, that's what people are going to ask. And I'm never going to give someone advice that I otherwise wouldn't feel comfortable giving. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, Cause there's a lot of yahoos out there, Mike, that are giving advice on areas they're not an expert in, but they're just silver tongued enough to make you think you're an expert and you're not. I mean, there's people giving advice about insurance agencies who have never run an insurance agency. And while yes, there's still some validity to that. Like I'd rather talk to the person that did it, you know, so I think just learning to learning what you're an expert in, learning to trust yourself, trust myself. That's kind of, I would say, is the biggest lesson. More so, gold nuggets. I mean, they just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. <laughs> Mike's holding that thing so close so, to the camera. I'm about to see my reflection in it. Well, so here, here's what I want you to see the reflection in. And I'm going to oh, go wow. to you, Scott. Yeah. I mean, this is what you're after right here. Your mm -hmm. acre of diamonds, baby. This is your agency. And you just got to keep polishing that puppy and polishing it, Scott. So our our uh, I protect twenty twenty two sales meeting that we had in December the the title of that sales meeting was think bigger, and I think for myself, Bradley and I have never had this conversation, Mike. So this is some real inside baseball for your listeners today. Uh, I think that. Bradley and I, based on where we came from and where we are today, we've got to think bigger. I think we're meant for more in this industry than just a podcast. Mm -hmm. I think that there's some tremendous opportunities out there for us in different areas. I don't really know exactly what that's going to be, so I can't sit here, but 
one of the things I will challenge each and every one of the people that are listening to this show today is think bigger. Uh, that was, that was the mantra of our sales meeting this, this year was, you know, we, I think sometimes we fall into that because people don't like to change. So they just keep doing the same thing, same thing. But I think our age, my agency needs to think bigger about what we're capable of doing and where we're, where we can go with this agency. And I think this podcast, our podcast needs to think bigger. I think we have a tremendous opportunity. We've proven ourselves in the industry. We do it every day. We're doing the same thing. All your listeners are doing as far as running an agency. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity to do something bigger than just the podcast. And I think that's kind of the direction we're going to be heading. Yeah. And don't we don't know what, know what that, don't know what is, that is. Yeah. No, don't we know. don't, but well, yeah, it, there definitely is some, there definitely is something in the future for us in the industry belong beyond the podcast, but for right now, we're going to keep doing the podcast and just see what happens, you know? Yeah. But, but to an extent you just did, because I mean, we're, we're kind of up against the clock here, but I mean, where did the one world tour start in your mind? And how long did it take to make it reality? Scott gave me the idea. I told him it was dumb. And then it ended up not being basically, you want to tell the story, Scott? Yeah. I, yeah. I don't remember. I just know that uh, it was a very humbling experience to get that yeah. many great agencies in one room mm -hmm. and that many great speakers. And uh, it, it was just, uh, you know, I think it was just something that, again, you got to think bigger. Yeah. Uh, and you can't just limit yourself. You know, the next thing is how do I get 5,000 people, uh, to Denver, Colorado, Nashville, Tennessee, or Dallas, Texas, which is our three choices for the one city world tour. I'll have for next Mike year. pay for it. I don't, I don't, I don't want 150 people there. I want 5,000 agents yeah. there. Yeah. That's, that's well, what I'm talking about. Always thinking bigger in terms of what this thing can become. And I think we've proven with the one city world tour, if you were there, you would know that it was a fantastic event, but now how do we get to that next level? How do we right. fill up Bridgestone arena? How do we fill up? You know, I would, I would love to fill up an entire football stadium. If we could be a lot of, I, I would love to talk about it and, and let me give you some feedback. Uh, and I'm going to give you direct feedback. You may or may not want to hear this, but you know, once you make that decision, start out as fast as you can and make sure you let all of us know, because, you know, frankly, I'm not paying attention to social media all day long. I'm like Bradley. I don't pay attention to my investment accounts all day long. I mean, right. I do what I have to do. I've got a specific agenda to be able to grow. So, yeah, let yeah. everybody know as fast as possible. Let me know so we can get it out to our networks, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So we're, we're definitely going to keep doing it. I don't necessarily want to be in the event space, but if I can do other things, if we can do other things and have the event be ancillary to that, you know, um, it, uh, it, it did add a lot of value to both Scott and I's lives. Um, I have, I told Scott, I was like, we need to make sure the budget next year has room for us to hire an event planner. So <laughs> yeah. if anybody's out there that's an event planner that's interested in organizing an insurance event next year, uh, hit me up. I would love to chat with you guys because I can help. So, and awesome. I want to help you guys at every opportunity. So let UPP me know. PP event planning. We just started <laughs> another business. There it is. There we, we go. See. So guys, Bradley Flowers, Get Portal Insurance, Scott Howell, I Protect Insurance. Uh, you guys rock. These are the insurance guys of the podcast world. Check out uh, the insurance guys podcast. Phenomenal, phenomenal content. And I will suggest that we are positioned for this podcast 2.0 because there's so much that we didn't get to today. They just kept dropping gold nugget after gold nugget after gold <laughs> nugget. And uh, here, here's the bottom line for everybody out there as we wrap today. The power of love and giving comes back tenfold. 100%. So if you can't figure out where to start today, just go find a way to give to somebody else. Yep. And everything else will take care of itself. You guys continue to give. Thank you for giving. Thank you for being on the podcast today, guys. You guys rock. I love you more, Mike. Thank no, you, Mike. No, I love you more, brother. All right, everybody. Hey, if you enjoyed the podcast today, make sure you go to unstoppableprofitpodcast.com subscribe so you don't miss one valuable episode. It's also out there on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and our YouTube channel. Uh, just go to Unstoppable Profit Producer, click on videos, and you can see all the episodes and the live visual. 
All right, everybody, have a phenomenal one-of-a-kind day. Get out there, make a difference, be unstoppable, leave no regrets, and remember this, you got this because we believe in you. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you for listening. If you would like to listen to more episodes or share this podcast with someone you care about, please visit www.unstoppableprofitpodcast.com. Now go out and make a difference. Be unstoppable and leave no regrets.